We're in Luke 6 this morning, verse 1 to 11. Luke chapter 6, verse 1 to 11. And the theme for today's message is the end of the Sabbath. I want to invite you to come back this afternoon. I'm going to preach on the Proverbs 31 woman. We all hear of her, we all know about her, uh, that there is a model woman, uh, the perfect woman almost. And so I want to invite you to come and listen. What is a Proverbs 31 woman? I think every man wants to know, and I hope the ladies want to know, so they can follow that example. And parents want to know, so they can teach their children what kind of woman they should look out for, not out for meaning be careful of, but look out, be on the lookout for when they get married. Luke 6 verse 1 to 11, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we come again to your word today. And it is my prayer that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to understand, a mind to grasp, hands and feet, and a body to obey, and a tongue, and a voice to proclaim the message of our Savior. Amen. Now, when we talk of the end of the Sabbath, it's like using the word, uh, the end of a season. You mean the season is over. But you can also use the word end in another way. You can, a man can say of his girlfriend, he can say, she is my beginning and my end. And he means she is everything to me. She is the one for whom I live. And in the same way, when I speak of the end of the Sabbath, I mean that the Old Testament Sabbath is over, it's past. But I also mean the end of the Sabbath. What is the end goal? What is the end toward which everything is pointing when we talk of the Sabbath? And so I'll explain that as we move along. So we're going to see this in two places when we speak of the end of the Sabbath. The first one is in the cornfields. Verse 1 to 5 of Luke 6. On a Sabbath, while Jesus was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any, but for the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I read on the internet about some Jewish uh, Sabbath laws, quite funny. For instance, on the Sabbath, the Jews aren't allowed, Orthodox Jews, they aren't allowed to use electric appliances or to switch on lights uh, unless they were on before the Sabbath started. And some, of the, some Jews will say the reason for this is when you switch on a light or use electric appliance, you're actually making a fire. And Exodus 35 verse 3 tells, God tells Israel, don't kindle a fire on the Sabbath day, don't start a fire uh, or kindle a fire because they were going to cook on the Sabbath and God said don't. Or other Jews will say the reason for this law is because when you use electric appliances or switch on lights, you're completing an electric circuit. And that means you're building something and you may not build on the Sabbath. Or the increased use of fuel on the Sabbath at the power station, if you're going to use electric appliances, you're increasing the use of fuel at the power station and that means you're actually cooking something. It's the same as cooking. Uh, or they got uh, what they call a Shabbat elevator. So on the Sabbath day, you, you're actually not supposed to push buttons, um, uh, electrical buttons. So they've got an elevator that opens on each floor, so you don't have to push the button. And that's exactly, that's exactly how the Jews in Jesus' day were. They had all these interpretations of the Old Testament Sabbath law that actually meant the Sabbath day becomes this, this chore, the Sabbath day becomes this burden, instead of a joy. 
And we see this in, in the two stories. Now, the first story, verse 1, as we read just now, says, On a Sabbath, while Jesus was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. And so what the, the Pharisees did, now they see Jesus' disciples in the grain fields, they pluck these heads of grain, rubbing the grain in their hands. And so they say, what you're busy doing is you're harvesting by plucking the grain, number one. Number two, by rubbing it in your hands, uh, you are busy threshing. Number three, by blowing away the chaff and not eating that, you are busy, um, what's the English word I'm looking for here? Uh, not threshing, where you separate the chaff from the wheat. But anyway, that word, uh, Afrikaans is eight one. And then finally, by eating the grain, you are busy preparing food. And so Leon Morris says, look at this. These are four different breaches of the Sabbath day in one mouthful. <laughs> now, if you were to ask the Pharisees, where do you get this from? Where in the Bible do you get this? We're not allowed to do this on the Sabbath. They would point you to De Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25. We read, if you're going to your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the, the ears of grain with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So Jesus and his disciples, they weren't disobeying that verse. They didn't put a sickle into the standing grain. They merely picked. And they were allowed to do that to still their hunger, to satisfy their hunger. And they were hungry according to Matthew 12 verse 1. But now the Pharisees see this and they rebuke Jesus and his disciples in verse 2. Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? <clears throat> because Exodus 31 verse 21 says you may not work on the Sabbath, not even during plowing time or harvest time. And now they're saying, well, you're busy working, Jesus, you and the disciples. And Jesus answers them from Scripture. He uses the Bible, not the twisted interpretations of some forefathers. And he reminds them of David in 1 Samuel 21, verse 1 to 6. That's what he's quoting in verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> what happened there was, David was running away. He was fleeing from King Saul. King Saul wanted to kill David. So David's running away, and he with some of his men, some of his soldiers. And he comes to Hermelech, the priest, in a town called Nob. And he's hungry. So he asked the priest, Ahimelech, he says, please, can you give me some bread for me and my men? And the priest says, I don't have any ordinary bread, but I do have the bread of the presence. But this is holy bread. This is bread, according to Leviticus 24, verse 5 to 9. <clears throat> Every Sabbath day, the priest would put out 12 fresh loaves of bread, flat bread, and he would put it in two piles of six. That represents the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> and so he put these loaves of bread there, and no one is allowed to eat of this bread in the tabernacle, in God's holy tent, in God's house. Only the priests were allowed to eat of this, and that on a, in a holy place, Leviticus 24 verse 9. And so when David comes here, and his men, they want bread, but there's no bread except this. And then Ahimelech the priest said, all right, you can eat this bread, but only if you haven't slept with women. And David says, listen, we haven't slept with women. We never do when we're on an expedition, when we're out fighting, when we're out in war. Um, because if they had slept with women, they would be ceremonially unclean. It simply means they wouldn't be able to come for public worship, uh, according to Leviticus 15 verse 18. But David says, we haven't slept with women. And so Ahimelech then takes the bread of the presence and he gives it to David and his men. <clears throat> now the bread was also symbolic to show that God feeds his people. God takes care of his people. <clears throat> and, and 12 loaves means God takes care of the 12, 12 tribes of Israel. God really is the bread that satisfies his people's hunger. Satisfies his people's hunger. Jesus himself said, I am the bread of life. And so here we see God taking care of David, providing for David and his men. David only wanted five ordinary loaves. God gives him more. God gives him the 12 loaves of the bread of the presence. And the same God that provided for David and his men through the priest Ahimelech 
This is the God in, verse, in Luke chapter 6, walking with his disciples through the grain fields, and he says to his disciples, I will provide for you. Here is grain to eat. You can pluck and eat. And he can do so if he wants, because verse 5 says, He's Lord of the Sabbath. What that means is, if he's Lord of the Sabbath, what Jesus is saying is, I was there at the creation. I created the world in six days, according to John 1 and, and Colossians 1 16. I created the world. I'm the creator. I was there when the Sabbath was created. I myself made and instituted the Sabbath day, the day of rest. And so I can decide how people should spend the Sabbath day. Now, actually, that is not the most important application here. Anyone who reads these verses and starts with pen and paper making a list of what you may and may not do on the Sabbath is ex doing exactly what the Pharisees did, and he's missing the whole point. <clears throat> Luke's point in these verses is not to focus on the Sabbath, but to focus on the Lord of the Sabbath, on Jesus. From the beginning, the Sabbath was merely a shadow pointing forward to the rest that we would have in Christ, the rest that Jesus brings through salvation. In the Old Testament, God gave the Sabbath day as a gift so that man could rest physically, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually. So the Sabbath was this one day in the week where you could recharge your batteries, where you could renew your strength, rejuvenate your strength to get ready for a new week of work. The Sabbath was never given as a burden, a punishment. Don't do this, do this, don't do that. No, the Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. Mark 2.27 The Sabbath was given as a gift, not as a burden. So the reason God made the Sabbath was to remind men and women and boys and girls that He completed His creation in six days and rested on the seventh. But what happened to that first creation? The moment Adam and Eve sinned, the first creation was cursed. And so that is why God became man. And he came into this world so he could bring a new creation. And so that is what we find in the New Testament. We see on the Sabbath day, the seventh day, Jesus lying in the tomb. But on the first day, Jesus rises from the dead and so he inaugurates a new creation. This is the beginning of a new creation. And the moment you and I are born again, we partake in a new creation. We become part of a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17, he is a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away, all things have become new. And so we no longer celebrate God's completion of the old creation on the seventh day. No, now we celebrate our partaking of a new creation through the resurrection of Jesus on the first day of the week. That's what the Old Testament predicted. That is how the New Testament understands it. In Psalm 118 verse 22, it, there's a prophecy about Jesus the Messiah, and it says that Jesus will be rejected, just like builders when they're looking for a foundation stone, the cornerstone, and they see this stone and they reject it. When was Jesus rejected? Well, he was finally rejected when they crucified him. When did Jesus, this stone that was rejected, became the cornerstone, says the prophecy? When did that happen? Jesus became the cornerstone when he rose from the dead on the first day of the week. And that is how Peter understands it in Acts 4, verse 10 and 11, when he quotes that prophecy from Psalm 118, verse 22. Peter says, <clears throat> in his quote, he says, You rejected him, but God has raised him from the dead. 
And this is to fulfill the prophecy. He was rejected just like builders reject a stone, but he has become now the cornerstone. And then the psalm continues, Psalm 118. And this is marvelous. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. And then in verse 24, it says, This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. What is the day the Lord has made? What is the day we should rejoice in? The day when the rejected stone became the cornerstone. And that is the day of Christ's resurrection, the first day of the week. That's exactly what the early church did. They no longer gathered on the Sabbath day for worship. They gathered on the first day of the week. Acts 20 verse 7. It says, on the first day of the week, they gathered to break bread. And then Paul preached to them. Or in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, in verse 2, <clears throat> Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth, and he says, when you gather on the first day, day of the week concerning the collection of the saints and he says it's not only for you I told the churches in Galatia also this is a common rule in all the churches on the first day of the week each one may put must put something aside because that's when they gather Revelation 1 verse 10 <clears throat> speaks of this day as the Lord's day now some people are going to tell you it's not what John means in Revelation 1 the Lord's Day doesn't mean the first day, it means the seventh day. No, it doesn't. The Lord's Day means the first day of the week. That is how Ignatius of Antioch understood this in the first century. He was born in the year 35 AD. So he, was, he knew the apostles. He knew all these first century Christians. He died in the year 107 AD. And he said, the Lord's Day is not the Sabbath, the seventh day. It is the first day of the week when Christ rose from the dead. Justin Martyr, he was born in the year 100 AD and died in 165. And Tertullian, born in 160 AD, died in 220 AD. Both of them say the same thing. They say that the church no longer celebrates the seventh day Sabbath, but the Lord's Day, which was inaugurated through the resurrection of Jesus on the first day of the week. And Tertullian, that church father, he emphasized the fact that Christians, when they worship Jesus on Sunday, it has got nothing to do with worshiping the Son, because that is a lie that people still use against, against Christians who gather on the first day for worship on Sundays. The, the Seventh-day Adventists, for instance, they still keep the Saturday Sabbath, and they say of Christians and the Hebrew Roots Movement and the Church of God, the groups called the Church of God, those groups groups believe in worshipping on, on a Saturday. And they say the reason we, Christians, worship on a Sunday is because we're worshipping the sun. That is nonsense, and Tertullian said so way back in the 2nd century AD. The reason we worship on a Sunday is because Christ rose on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, and Jesus is the Son of Righteousness according to Malachi 4 verse 2. So the Old Testament Sabbath, the Old Testament Sabbath rest pointed to Christ. So we're not focusing any longer on shadows. It was a shadow. We have now got the fullness in Christ. And this is what Colossians 2 teaches us in verse 16 and 17. Colossians 2 verse 16 and 17. Paul writes to that church and about the Sabbath, he says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in question of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. We have the substance. We have Christ. Why go back to the shadows? Now some people will tell you, no, the Sabbath in verse 16 only means the Sabbaths that were, were celebrated during feasts. It has nothing to do with a weekly Sabbath. Well, that is nonsense, because in Leviticus 23, the Sabbath day, the weekly Sabbath rest, is regarded as one of the seven feasts of Israel. Go and read it. And in verse 16, Paul distinguishes between festivals and the Sabbath here. He doesn't merely point to the Sabbath of festivals. 
This is about the Sabbath day. That is a shadow and the Old Testament Sabbath. And now we have the fullness in Christ. And so Jesus is the one who gives us true rest. That rest that the Israelites couldn't find when they entered the promised land. They just couldn't find rest. Because you read in the book of Judges, again and again you read they rested for 40 years, but then the enemies came again. And then they had rest for 80 years and oppressed them. And then the enemies came again. Or they rested and the enemies oppressed them again. But now in Christ we have rest. Because everyone who believes in Jesus has entered the Sabbath rest. Hebrews 4 verse 3 and also verse 8 to 10. Joshua couldn't give the people this rest, but Christ, the new Joshua, brings this rest. And we'll enjoy this rest in full. The fullness of it, the absolute completion of it when we die and go to heaven and we are with Christ. Revelation 14 verse 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, that they may rest from their labors. Are you sure you have this rest? Has Jesus come to bring rest for your soul? Rest for the turmoil in your soul. Have you found rest in Christ? Or is your conscience still bothering you and you want to run away? Or you're trying to silence your conscience with religious works? You try, you'll do anything just so you can forget about your sin. But you aren't resting. You're running away in your conscience. You're running away in your heart and your mind. Well, doing all of these religious stuff won't work. Because only in Christ can you find rest. That's what we read in Matthew. Uh, the passage right before this section. This passage of the, the disciples and Jesus on the Sabbath day in the cornfields. In Matthew's uh, rendering of this, Matthew's record of this. The passage right before this. We read the following. This is Matthew 11 verse 28 to 30. And then chapter 12 verse 1 starts this passage on the Sabbath. But Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest. There is the true Sabbath. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus' words still go for, they still apply today. Today, even today, even in this very morning, Jesus is saying to you, come to me. The only requirement is that you should and must acknowledge that you are burdened. And you feel heavy laden. You feel you've got this burden on your back, on your soul. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge that you need Christ. And that not only goes for unbelievers, that goes for Christians too. Some of you are burdened, you are heavy laden, you are tired. And to you too, Jesus is saying, come to me. Just come to me and I will give you rest. Or according to 1 Peter 5 verse 7, cast your burden on the Lord because he cares for you. So that was the first place in the cornfields. The second place we find here is in the synagogue. Verse 6 to 11. On another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched Jesus to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find reason to accuse him. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to the man with a withered hand, Come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good? Or to do harm? To save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and the hand was restored. His hand was restored. But they, that's the Pharisees, were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. I listened to an interview many years ago. An interview Ian Murray had with John MacArthur. And John MacArthur said to Ian Murray in the interview, he said, you know, when I started out as a pastor, I expected opposition. 
I knew I would have to fight against false teaching. But let me tell you something. I never dreamed that I would have to defend the gospel against evangelicals. Evangelicals is people who say they believe and preach the gospel. And that's always been the case, really. The greatest opposition has always come from religious people, people who call themselves the children of God. And we see it from chapter 5, verse 27. We see it four times up to, uh, until chapter 6, verse 11. And every time it's the Pharisees, these religious people, they're opposing Jesus. And now in the incident here, the incident in front of us, Jesus is preaching in a synagogue in verse 6. Synagogue is a Jewish place of worship. So Jesus is preaching there, and there's a man with a withered hand. So his hand is really dried up in a sense. There's no life in it. And it's his right hand, it says, like a man I knew when I was a kid. I can't remember, was it his right or his left hand? But he was in the Methodist church, and we were too. And he had this withered hand, this little hand. And so then now the, the, the Pharisees are, are watching Jesus with an eagle eye, with a hawk's eye. They're just watching Jesus, trying to catch him. Will he heal this man on the Sabbath day? They're looking for a reason to go and accuse Jesus in verse 7. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. Verse 7. They, they waiting, they're watching Jesus to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath. They know Jesus can heal people. And still they do not believe he comes from God. They don't believe he's the Messiah or the Son of God. And in their minds, how can it be? How can he be the Messiah? Because he's breaking our rules. Isn't that how, how legalists, legalists have always been? Legalists are people who think you get saved by keeping the law. Legalists have always been this way. They still like this. And sometimes we too, we still fall into this very same trap. So you're sitting in church, and someone sitting right next to you is hearing the preaching of the word, and God is comforting his soul. Or maybe he's, he's busy being saved, he's busy being converted, he's busy repenting of his sin, God is changing him, he's being born again. But you, you don't feel anything. You're not moved at all. You don't care, you couldn't care less that this person is being comforted or being saved. Because you're sitting there with a critical spirit because the preacher has gone over his time. He's preaching longer than 35 minutes or 40 minutes and you are angry. You are angry because the preacher said he doesn't believe in the rapture. And you're angry about that. You're waiting, actually waiting for the pastor to say something wrong. He must just say something you don't agree with so you can send him a... A nasty email after the service when you get her home. You see, legalism is ugly. Legalism is ugly because you care more about your own rules than you care about God. You care more about your own rules than you care about people created in the image of God. And you might say this is God's rules you're concerned about, but it's not. And you might say that it's all about God's honor for you in your eyes and in your thoughts. It's about God's glory I'm concerned about, but it's not. It's about your own glory. It's about your own honor. You think you're better than other people. And you look down upon people who don't keep the rules as well as you do. You've got this obsession with your rules. And because of this obsession, you have no idea what a living and personal relationship with God means. And your religion is mainly, just ask yourself the question, if you're a legalist, your religion is mainly negative, it's not positive. Everyone knows what you're against, what you don't believe, but do they know what you do believe? What are you standing for? And because you're a legalist and you're so obsessed with rules, you are joyless, you are hypercritical, and you are hard on other people, especially on your family. Because they don't do this, and they don't do this, and they do this. And they, all these rules. And you don't know how to show mercy and grace to other people because you yourself have never experienced God's mercy and grace. So what you need is not the gospel, really. You need Jesus' interpretation of the law before you need the gospel. Because you're bragging and you're boasting about how well you keep the law. But how are you doing? How are you doing when it comes to bitterness and to anger and to lust? 
Matthew 5, verse 21 to 30. You say you're not murdering. Jesus said if you're bitter and angry, you're a murderer. You say you're not committing adultery. You're not sexually immoral. Jesus said if you're lusting, you've already committed adultery in your heart. What about, what about idolatry? What about greed? What about covetousness? Chasing money, materialism. <clears throat> like the rich young ruler. I've kept these laws, Jesus. I've kept the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, sell you all your stuff and give the money to the poor. And he couldn't. Because he's greedy. He's got an idol, and that idol is money. How well are you keeping the law? Are you keeping the law perfectly? Are you sinless? Because that's what Galatians 3 verse 10 says. If you rely on law keeping, you should do it perfectly. Under, otherwise, you're under a curse. <clears throat> and so, so, to tell you the truth, then, you're not as, you're not as good as you think you are. Uh, you, need, you need the death of Jesus on the cross. You need the forgiveness of Christ like the rest of us. So when will you swallow your pride? When will you acknowledge that your heart is filled with sin and that you need the grace of God in Christ? Because Jesus knows your thoughts as well as he knew the Pharisees' thoughts. Verse 8. Jesus knew their thoughts. John 2 verse 24 and 25 says Jesus knew the hearts of all men. And because he knew the, the plans the Pharisees were making against him, he called this man to the front because he wants to heal him in front of everyone. Everyone must see Jesus is the Messiah. So he calls the man. He says, come and stand here, verse 8. And so the man comes, we read, and, and Jesus asks a question in verse 9. And he says, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? So according to Jesus, there's no gray area. It's black or it's white. That's all. There's, there's nothing in between. Either on the Sabbath you're going to help people or you're going to harm people. Or you're going to bring the gospel and save people or you're going to destroy people. It's almost like James 4 verse 17. If someone knows the right thing to do and he doesn't do it, for him it is sin. If you know what is right, you don't do it, you're sinning. If you're not doing good to people on the Sabbath, if you're not saving people on the Sabbath, you're destroying them. You're harming people. And so Jesus looks around at them all, verse 10, because he just asked a question. He's looking at them. Are they going to answer his question? But they're quiet. They don't have an answer. And so Jesus is really grieved. He's angry because of their hardness of heart, says Mark 3, verse 5. And to show that he is the Messiah, Jesus says to the man, stretch out your hand, in verse 10. And the moment the man does that, the instant he does it, his hand is healed. And then the Pharisees do something very strange. They do exactly what Jesus has just told them you shouldn't do on the Sabbath or any other day. They are beside themselves with anger in verse 11. And Jesus said, what should we do on the Sabbath? Should we, should we preserve life? Should we do good or harm? Should we save life or destroy? And what are they doing? Jesus just, just preserved life. Jesus did, just did well, he did good, but now they are going to do evil. They are going and they gather and they discuss what they might do to Jesus. In verse 11, or Mark 3 verse 6, they're making plans how they can destroy Jesus. They want to kill him. So they're angry Jesus is doing good on the Sabbath, while they are making plans to kill someone on the Sabbath. So can you see how, how blind legalists are, how blind legalism makes you? Legalism causes that you become so angry <clears throat> when someone shares the good news with you. I remember a story like this where <clears throat> a man wanted to share the gospel with his brother. And this brother became so angry, he cut off. It's like he pushed out his brother and says, he said, because you want to share the good news with me, the gospel, I won't talk to you. And he didn't talk to him for months. He couldn't understand that all that his brother was trying to do was to save him. His brother was trying to do him good. I experienced a similar thing. I had once had to speak to a woman about her sin. And I spoke to her face to face at first, but then later on when I wanted to make an appointment, she ignored me and she ignored my phone calls. And so eventually I had to write her a letter, and I did. And I picked my words carefully. And I read through the letter again and again to see... Am I doing this, saying this gently? And I ended the letter with these words. 
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And that's what made her so angry. She was angry. She was furious. How dare I say she needs the grace of God? Is, am I such a great sinner that I need the grace of God? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever experienced this kind of thing. Maybe you wanted to share the gospel with someone, but they just cut you off. They didn't, they didn't let you even finish. They, and they say to you, I have my church. Or maybe, maybe they even chased you away. Like a man who shouted at me when I shared the gospel with him. But that's just pride. It's pride that causes people to do that. Because they think, I'm not so bad that I need Jesus. And then, then we just full circle now. We come back to the problem that I addressed just a while back. So I, I don't know what, what more I should say to you. I just want to encourage you. It doesn't help you get involved in debates. Don't get involved in a debate with people, uh, people who are legalists or legalistic groups. It doesn't help, for instance, it doesn't help you try and show someone that you don't need to keep the seventh day Sabbath in order to be saved. It doesn't help you talk to some from, someone from the Hebrew Roots Movement and you try to convince them that you don't need to keep the, the seventh day Sabbath in order to be saved. They, they just can't see that. They'll tell you what a Seventh-day Adventist once told me uh, when he read one of my sermons on the Sabbath. He said, I hope you see the truth before it is too late. I hope God opens your eyes before it's too late. <clears throat> In order to win a legalist for the Lord, that's harder than to win a, a prostitute for the Lord or a murderer for the Lord. But, in the same breath, I want to say, that what is impossible with man is impossible with God. And I, I hope you find that a comfort. Because some of you, you've got these legalists in your family. Or in your circle of friends. Or one of your colleagues at work. Or another kid at school. They're part of these legalistic groups. They're so legalistic, they think, do this, don't do that. Keep these laws. Keep the seventh day Sabbath. And you'll be saved if you don't. Don't pick corn on the Sabbath. Don't do this. Uh, they're religious people, they're church people, they're church-going people, but they're not saved. So you just keep on praying for them, you just keep on showing the love of Jesus to them in practical ways. And hopefully somewhere, God will show them the light and shine the light in their eyes like he did with the Apostle Paul, when Paul was a legalist, before he got saved. Or like John Wesley in the 1700s. For years and years and years, John Wesley was a religious person. He was even a missionary, but he wasn't saved. And then God saved him. And hopefully, the Lord will do the same for your family and friends. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us your word this morning. And thank you for giving us your grace. And it is my prayer today that you would please Help us to focus on not the Sabbath day, a seventh day Sabbath, but on the Sabbath's Lord. And on this first day of the week where we gather for worship and rest in Christ and experience and enjoy the rest of salvation. And I pray that you would bring this rest for any who are still struggling and running from their own consciences and their own sin, that they would come and rest in Christ even today. In Jesus' name. Amen.